discontinuation of hydrochloric acid in our drinking water. I understand it's the city's current official position that they want this removed from the drinking water, but that due to the fact that not four of seven members of laws have voted to take it out, that it remains in. Uh, what I'd like today is a, is a vote of the current council, so again, that'd be a current council's position on the, the issue. So I know you're busy, I'll get to it. Um, as you're all aware, in January 2013, the Safe Drinking Water Act downloaded full responsibility and liability to municipal councils for the drinking water and anything added to it. Section 20 of that act states that no person shall cause or permit anything to enter the drinking water if it could, and that's the threshold, if it could result in a drinking water health hazard. Subsection 3 goes on to state that dilution of that substance is no defense. Health Canada has finally been forced to admit that human health harm toxicology has never been conducted on hydrochloric salicylic acid. It's never been tested for human health. If you care to invest the time, you'll find that none of the uh, organizations that endorse fluoridation, including Health Canada, the FDA, will not warrant, verify, or even suggest that hydrochloric salicylic acid is safe for human consumption. Municipal councils are now responsible for endorsing this product for human consumption. And in the event it is determined that the addition of this product could cause or does cause harm, are now 100% liable. The hydrochloric acid used at laws is purchased from Solvay Fluorides out of Texas. And along with the product, they supply a safety data sheet and a certificate of analysis as required by law. The safety data sheet speaks to handling and what to do in case of a spill. The certificate of analysis speaks to what's actually in the product. In uh, Solvay's certificate, uh, or safety data sheet rather, on page one, clearly states this product is harmful if swallowed and harmful if inhaled. And on page 13 of 17, it verifies that the Environmental Protection Agency deems this product an industrial hazardous waste. In the certificate of analysis, it clearly shows that when this product's added, that they are adding arsenic, lead, heavy metals, along with radium. So what is currently being endorsed? A certified hazard industrial toxic waste, as confirmed by the EPA, the addition of lead, arsenic, mercury, barium, beryllium, chromium, cadmium, and up to four different radioactive ions or radionuclides. Several of these are confirmed and or suspected human carcinogens and neurotoxins. Studies confirm that when you mix hydrofloor silicic acid with chlorine, as we do at laws, that you will create an extremely powerful lead leaching agent that will leach additional lead out of the water treatment system right from the plant to your tap. Um, Hydroflow silicic acid is only acknowledged at Health Canada in freedom of information requests. If you contact Health Canada and ask for any reports, any studies, toxicology, or clinical tests, Relating to hydroflow silicic acid, the response will be that no records exist. Hydroflow silicic acid addition to the drinking water has been linked by hundreds of medical professionals in hundreds of human and animal studies to cause a variety of very serious health issues, including cancer, hypothyroidism, ADD, ADHD, skeletal fluorosis, kidney disease, diabetes, endocrine disruption, bone fracture, and arthritis, among others. Hydroflow silicic acid has never been tested for human harm toxicology and it has never been approved for human consumption or for the treatment of any condition, including the prevention of dental caries. It's not endorsed for use in, fluoridate, in fluoridating water by any of the organizations that promote fluoridation policy. They would all prefer that you endorse it and that you warrant that there's no harm to human health. So is there harm being caused? This graph by the uh, World Health Organization shows that back in the 1950s, before they added this to the water, dental fluorosis in children was about 10%, and in its very mildest form, and we were assured that if they kept fluoride at one part per million or less, that they could keep dental fluorosis in children at that 10% mark in its very mildest form. This graph by the World Health Organization shows that as of 2010, it was 41% of children had dental fluorosis, which is the white spotting on teeth and the visual manifestation of, vi of fluoride toxicity or fluoride poisoning. And the most recent national survey by the US Center for Disease Control shows that up to 64% of adolescents now have dental fluorosis, 
with up to 29% of them having the advanced form of this condition. The EPA has just uh, developed a database of chemicals where they divide chemicals into, into two different groups, that being either minimal or substantial evidence of developmental neurotoxicity. When you add hydroflow silicic acid to the water, as we do, you're adding at least four chemicals that are found on the EPA's list of chemicals with substantial evidence of develop, de developmental neurotoxicity. Recent studies show a strong correlation between water fluoridation and ADHD. The study authored by psychologists Christine Till and Ashley Mallon at Toronto's York University revealed the following that for every 1% increase in the population of the U.S. drinking fluoridated water in 92, it was associated with 67,000 additional cases of ADHD 11 years later and an additional 131,000 cases by 2011 after controlling for socioeconomic status. Since 1992, the percentage of the U.S. population that drinks fluoridated water has increased from 56 to 67 percent during which time the percentage of children diagnosed with ADHD has increased from 7% to 11% according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. ADHD is a neurological disorder with no known cure. Hydroflow silicic acid contains at least four chemicals with substantial evidence of neurotoxicity and is being added to our drinking water. The water at Laws currently contains at least 14 chemicals on the Environmental Protection Agency's list of substantial risk for developmental neurotoxicity. Ask me about combined toxicity and chemical synergies. So what do we know? Studies have shown that children in fluoridated communities like ours have up to twice the blood lead levels of those living in non-fluoridated communities. Lead is being added to the drinking water with the addition of hydroflow silicic acid. Studies have shown again that when you mix hydroflow silicic acid and chlorine, you make an extremely powerful lead leaching agent, which will leach even more lead into the system. Health Canada confirms that lead affects intellectual development and behavior in infants and children under six. Further, it can, infect, or can affect the unborn child and pregnant women and is classified as probably carcinogenic to humans. Further, Health Canada indicates that in adults with a normal diet, 5% of ingested lead is retained in the body, while children under 8 retain 40 to 50% of the lead that they ingest. Animal studies have proven that lead uptake is increased when fluoride is also present in water, which it is. With respect to arsenic, Health Canada classifies it as a class 1 human carcinogen of the lung, bladder, liver, and skin. Health Canada further states that because arsenic can cause cancer, Every effort should be made to keep arsenic levels in drinking water as low as possible. Arsenic is currently being added to our drinking water with the addition of hydroflow silicic acid. What we know about fluoride is that according to the National Toxicology Program, the preponderance of evidence from laboratory studies indicates that fluoride is a mutagen, which is a compound that causes genetic damage and one that can likely cause or contribute to the development of cancer. Dental fluorosis rates are at epidemic rates despite the assurances this wouldn't happen. The 2006 U.S. National Academies of Sciences National Research Council Subcommittee on Fluoride and Drinking Water determined that children under three should get absolutely no fluoride supplementation whatsoever. That's impossible for children in our community. Fluoride is ranked as slightly more toxic than lead and slightly less toxic than arsenic. Health Canada sets maximum allowable concentration levels of lead and arsenic at 10 parts per billion, Laws tries to add enough hydroflow silicic acid to maintain fluoride at around 700 parts per billion. Health Canada and the CDC have both confirmed that swallowing fluoride in drinking water has very little, if any, effect on preventing dental caries. Health Canada's Chief Dental Officer of Health has recently been quoted as confirming that if you drink this for a lifetime, it will result in less than one cavity reduction per person per lifetime. Fluoride's a cumulative toxin that collects in the, in the teeth, bone, and soft tissue. The World Health Organization has warned that excessive exposure, like our children are getting, to fluoride in drinking water in combination with exposure to fluoride from other sources can give rise to a number of adverse effects. Those range from mild dental fluorosis to crippling skeletal fluorosis as the level and period of exposure increases. Fluoride was used as a medication up through the 1950s for people that had hyperactive or overactive thyroid to slow the thyroid. 
we now give it to an entire population and have epidemic rates of hypothyroidism centered primarily around fluoridated communities. Four years after San Francisco began fluoridating their drinking water, there was a 400% increase in cases, cases of hypothyroidism. What we know about the other contaminants is that they cause irreversible neurological symptoms in large liver, class one carcinogens, and so on. In closing, it should be a large red flag to council for all the powerful government and professional organizations that endorse water fluoridation. None will endorse the use of or accept the liability for the addition of hydroflow silicic acid. Are you confident that the addition, of, the addition of this product to our drinking water doesn't breach the Safe Drinking Water Act and does not cause, in, cause possible harm to uh, human health? When there are scores of doctors, dentists, toxicologists, and scientists that believe it absolutely does result in human health harm. If the addition of hydroflow silicic acid was discontinued from our water supply, no doctor or dentist could legally prescribe this product to anybody they would lose their medical license because it's not approved for use on humans. Canada's chief dental officer of health confirming little benefit to ingesting fluoride. So if they were to prescribe anything, they would prescribe pharmaceutical grade sodium fluoride. If you place any faith whatsoever in Health Canada's system for setting maximum allowable concentration levels of contaminants in our water supply, and believe it will keep us safe from harm, I'd be more than happy to explain how the entire process for setting these safe levels of contaminants is fundamentally flawed. Remember, Health Canada's MAC level for fluoride is 1.5 parts per million, 50% higher than the level that resulted in epidemic dental fluorosis, and 150 times the allowable, or 150 times the allowable amount of less toxic lead. Are there any questions? Councillor Shilton, Councillor Bushy, Councillor Mitro. Thank you, Mayor Bradley, and thank you to our, our speaker, Rod, for uh, bringing this information to us. It's very impressive, and uh, you've done a lot of work, and I certainly don't want this in our water. I know that uh, this council doesn't, and from knocking on many doors two years ago, I also know the community doesn't want it in their water. So it's pretty scary to me. If you could just answer a couple of questions. One is... Um, just to re-clarify the link to cancer with this fluoride and also what can we do to help to, to take it out? I know what can we do, maybe your suggestions to reach out to the other municipalities, what are our options? Well, there's, uh, there's several credible links to cancer. Uh, study, one study from Harvard University done by Elise Basson, which linked it to osteosarcoma, which is a very rare bone cancer typically suffered by young men. Uh, the EPA commissioned a study that was completed by the Battelle Group that confirmed the same thing. So there's been two very credible studies showing a link to osteosarcoma as well as a very rare liver cancer that has a name about that long and I won't even try to pronounce it. Uh, as far as what the city can do, I believe it's incumbent upon the city council, if it's our official position that we want this product removed from our water, that we instruct the city solicitor to draft a letter of indemnity and insist that Sarnia, its citizens, and the members of council that are against this practice be held harmless from any future legal liabilities because all current relevant medical information that's coming down the pipe now all points to this causing significant harm. Councillor Mitro, sorry, Councillor Bushi, Councillor Mitro, Councillor White. Uh, am I next? Yes, sir. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation. About those studies, <laughs> you, you see all kinds of studies uh, for and against. You, you're aware of that. The question I have for you is some municipality took the fluoride out of the water and now they put it back in. Uh, I, I had a press clipping, but I, I forgot it at home. Why do you say about those people are putting it back in? I haven't heard of anyone taking it back in. I know Windsor's taking it in, but I, one interesting case is Leamington, Ontario, which is fluoride free. And the reason that Leamington's fluoride free is because Heinz, when they were packaging their products, insisted that they not put hydroflow silicic acid in or they would move out of Leamington because they, they know and they're schooled and aware and they don't want that in their baby food products. I've got Councillor Mitro, Councillor White. Um, just kind of following up on that, um, 
Is there a schism in, in the science of it? Are there studies that are saying that specifically, I get that, that fluoride topically, um, as provided in toothpaste, has been proven to, to be a benefit to, uh, to the uh, health of your teeth, but that's something very different than drinking it in your, your water. So what, what's, is there a divide on the science, so to speak, one side to the other? Not current science, and you're right. The, the medical community, the dental community now seem to be in unison and agreement that fluoride's effect, beneficial effect, if any, is topical in nature, meaning you apply it to your teeth, not systemically. Um, systemically, the ideal daily recommended amount of fluoride is zero. Your body doesn't need fluoride. There's no metabolic process in your body that requires fluoride. And the only reason you put fluoride in your body is in hopes that you're saving cavities, which the Dental Officer of Health for Canada has come out and suggested that drinking it for an entire lifetime may save you one cavity. But if in turn it's causing a few cases of cancer, many cases of hypothyroidism, and if it's poisoning our children, which it is, because I see kids all the time now with the white splotches on their teeth, and there's only one cause for that, and that's fluoride toxicity. That's from overexposure to fluoride, and the fluoride in your toothpaste is pharmaceutical grade sodium fluoride, and you are told specifically on the tube of toothpaste to spit that pharmaceutical grade out, but we're putting an industrial toxic waste in the water and the reason we're doing it is because it does also contain some fluoride on top of lead, arsenic, and all the other contaminants. Your Worship, I had a quick follow-up on that. Um, one of the things that really struck me in, in reading through stuff on this was, could you describe to me what that actual product that comes from Texas is? How did they get that? Because that struck me. It's a, it's a waste product from the smokestacks of the uh, phosphate fertilizer industry. And how it ends up in their smokestack is they used to just let it go out the smokestack. But for a circumference around that smokestack, they were killing everything. Fruit orchards, livestock, people, and there were huge lawsuits. And they decided, okay, we got to stop that. And they told them, you can't put that out the stack anymore because you're killing everything. So they installed wet scrubbers in the stacks to help keep those contaminants in the smokestack. And that is what they then load on a truck and put into the drinking water. So if it goes out the stack, it's a criminal offense. I wrote the Ministry of Environment and told them that I'd like to bring a tanker of hydroflow silicic acid into town and just discharge it into the St. Clair River, and would that be okay? And I got back a very long letter explaining to me why that would very much not be okay and explaining the penalties for doing so but we're injecting it directly into our drinking water. Thank you. I've got Councillor White. I've got Councillor Brusevich, uh, Couch, and Gillis for questions. Thank you, Mayor Bradley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gowry, for your um, presentation. I know this has been a, uh, a topic of discussion across the country for many, many years, and you could fill my desk in two different piles with uh, opposing information and studies. So uh, I do appreciate the time that you've put into this. Uh, I have a couple questions for you. Um, uh, one, ha has this been challenged at all under the Safe Drinking Water Act, to your knowledge? I don't know if it has, and I don't know who would, because somebody's got to bring that to court and pay those legal costs, and if for someone like myself to bring it to court, I not only fund the side to fight it, but my tax dollars fund the other side. So I don't know that it's ever been challenged in court, but I believe there's sufficient evidence when the threshold is you can't allow anything in that could cause harm. There's arsenic and lead in there alone. And when we know that over 60% of children's teeth, adult <coughs> teeth, are permanently damaged, you can call that aesthetic damage if you like. You can say that it's not a medical condition, but you are causing harm to children. And I've talked to people whose children are bothered by this as children will be and ask, Mommy, when will these white spots come off my teeth? And the answer is they won't. That counts. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, one other question for you. Uh, actually, two. Uh, what made you uh, take this on as an issue? What's your personal interest in it? And then you uh, wanted us to ask you about chemical synergies, so I'll throw that out there for you. Yeah. What got me started years ago, I looked into building healthy homes. 
and early on in that process um, discovered that one of the main pollutants in indoor air quality in newer homes was the chlorine in our water. When you shower, when you flush a toilet, when you run a dishwasher, that volatilizes into the air and gives you measurable levels of chloroform gas. And from there, it just went on. I've studied, studied water a fair bit from there. I ignored fluoride, sadly. Um, and probably about a year ago, started looking into the fluoride. And for anybody that spent the time that does the research and follows the medical professionals that look into this in depth, you can't help but be offended. As far as chemical synergies go, I, I spoke with Health Canada early on before I took on the, the fluoride issue and asked the fellow at Health Canada, I said, do you set your MAC levels the same way they do in the US, assuming that there's only one chemical present in the water, which they know there's hundreds, and assuming it's a 150 pound adult. And he said, well, yeah, 155 pounds. I said, but you understand there's more than one chemical in the water. And when you mix chemicals, chemists and toxicologists know that you can increase their toxicity by up to a thousand times. Um, we've got 14 known chemicals on the list of substantial evidence of neurotoxicity and we're getting epidemic rates of ADD, ADHD in children, as well as a huge rise, rise in autism. If I were to ask you what are the results of mixing those 14 known neurotoxins together and giving them to kids from the time they're in the womb, you can't tell me. And the sad part is nobody can tell me because nobody knows. But we know a lot of kids are getting sick and a lot of medical experts are pointing to this as being one of the causes. Thank you. I want to keep this moving along here. I've got uh, other councillors. I've got Councillor Brusevich, I've got Councillor Couch and Councillor Gillis for questions. I'll try to, to keep it uh, short. Uh, is the practice of adding HFSA common across uh, the country? You know, uh, if I look, we all know about Quebec City 2008, in a way, and there's more and more uh, Calgary. I think that's what Councillor Bushy was referring to. They, uh, they discontinue, and then some statistics came up saying there was some rise in, the, you know, in cavities. And that hold until the time when somebody else dig further back and found out that actually the rise in cavities has been already taking place before it was discontinued. So, so that theory uh, didn't hold for too long. There was a little bit of, of division there. Uh, so anyway, could you comment on what's happening across the country and around the world, if, if you care? Well, across North America, the primary means of fluoridation is hydroflow silicic acid, not necessarily because it's effective, certainly not because it's been tested or proven safe, because it hasn't, but because it's cheap. It's, a, it's an industrial toxic waste that would cost these companies millions of dollars a year to dispose of, except we buy it and put it into our water. We could put sodium fluoride, pharmaceutical grade sodium fluoride in our water if we wanted to fluoridate it without adding arsenic, lead, chromium, cadmium, and all the other contaminants, but we don't because it costs more money. Oh, just a quick, uh, you, you're probably aware I was watching, I was almost embarrassed about the quality of representation we get at Queen's Park because there's a private bill there trying to man, to, to force all the municipalities to do it. I'm not sure where it's going, it's private bill, sometimes it doesn't go too far. But uh, do, you have, do, 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 do you have any plans to engage the provincial politicians, you know, to, to perhaps, uh, from your perspective, to, to prevent it to happen, or, or, or you just let it uh, go? Did you contact with the local member of provincial parliament? I haven't yet. Quite honestly, if I can end it in Lambton County, um, that's probably about where my fight will end. I don't have the time or the energy to take it beyond that. I believe it should be a banned practice across the, uh, the country. Um, I know that local members bill, there is someone trying to mandate and take it out of control of the city and make it a province-wide mandate that we all have to drink this poison. But I think in light of recent studies, credible studies, you'll not see that happen because there is liability for this, and somebody will pay, and that's why they've downloaded it to you, so that they are not liable. And so far as Calgary, sorry, just because I didn't answer Mr. Bush's question, they didn't put it back in the water, and the report that cavity spiked after they took it out was debunked within 24 hours, 
with a study done in 2010 that they didn't bother to include showing that most of the dental decay occurred between 2005 and 2011 while Calgary was still fluoridating their water and that it stayed completely on trend and didn't spike whatsoever when they took it out. There are between 12 and 14 countries in the world that have better DMFT rates, dental mi damage missing or filled tooth rates than we do and they put none of this poison in their water. How is that possible if fluoride is somehow benefiting our teeth and we have worse DMFT rates than 12 or 14 countries that don't do it? Councillor Couch and then Councillor Gillis questions. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, thanks, Rod, for the presentation. We've been down this road, as you know. A couple times. Um, it's, it's the mass medication part that you are really have the issue with, right? the involuntary med mass medication via a substance that everyone needs to live. That's a, because you're not arguing about pros and cons of clinical fluoride or, or any of that, are you? You're, you're really just sort of saying you've got the right to have clinically safe drinking water delivered to your tap. That's what you pay the, the municipality for. Right? Is That's that, correct, yes. Okay. But what's being done right now is, is illegal because you are mass medicating people without informed consent. And I understand that it was originally put in the water via plebiscite, meaning the public voted on it. But I can assure you the plebiscite read something like this. Would you like us to put fluoride in the water? We're going to pay for it and it's going to stop cavities. And based on that question, who wouldn't say yes? Okay, so you're aware that the council, the previous council, was on the record as voting against fluoridation. Correct. But the system that we have in place through the Lambton Area Water Supply System gives the other municipalities a say, and they did not concur. So what, how do you see a way forward here other than, the, I appreciate the indemnity that you want to protect the council, I get that. Yeah. But as far as actually being able to make a change that says we're going to stop doing this, where do you see us going? Twofold, I guess. I, I'm, I'm hoping in light of this and depending on new members of council, when I approach members from other municipalities and approach their councils, I would love to go to them with a nine to nothing vote from Sarnia showing very clear support. The five to four official recorded vote suggests to many that yeah, maybe there's some validity to this and maybe there's not. And I assure you there's not. But if I can go with a significant number showing that Sarnia is very much against this, if the city of Sarnia would help me pull on the rope and have the city solicitor prepare a letter of indemnity, and if the, municip the other municipalities that are forcing us to keep it in are convinced that it's causing no harm, then they should have absolutely no problem accepting all the liability that goes along with adding it. Thanks. Yeah, I've got Councillor Gillis, and I have a couple of questions for you, Mr. Gary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. A lot of my uh, questions have already been answered by the questions that Councillor Kelch posed to you, Mr. Gowery, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm on record as being opposed to fluoride added to the water, and the reason for my uh, opposition is because it has a cumulative effect, and there is no way, once it goes into the water, there's no way to get it out. So uh, having said that, and realizing that we do have a couple of motions coming forward with regard to laws, um, and our position on laws, as we only have one vote, but we are the largest stakeholder. Um, I would suggest that perhaps you might wait to see where that goes before you start on your roadshow. Because if we have a power of veto, say, um, and that would, I'm sure, involve a lot of legalities and, and discussion and constitutionalities, that could, all that good stuff. Um, I would, per if I were you, I would wait to see where that would go first and then proceed following that to see where that's going to go. But I am on record and I stay on record. Thank you. Gary, Mike, I won't have any questions for you. I do have some advice for council as chair of the, of the council. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Council, the only thing I want to bring to your attention is that the, we've dealt with this issue many times, many councils have. I think it's incumbent upon you not just to hear one voice. Uh, the last time we had a and I, I hesitate to recommend this, I, a public meeting which drew over 25 different uh, voices, a medical officer of health and others in the community that had a different viewpoint. And uh, while I respect Mr. Gowery has a, a point of view, I think that you need to at least allow others 
to have their input on this decision before you make a final decision. Otherwise, if you do tonight, I think you'll find out tomorrow that it, it's not going to be accepted by others. Um, could I suggest that, or as I read this this weekend, I thought it would be really interesting to pass this over to our medical officer of health and provide some opinion back. I um, checked with Lambton Public Health and, and asked for um, a position from uh, Lambton Public Health on this. And I believe that there is still a pretty strong opinion out there that in terms of um, helping to protect the teeth of low-income people, primarily children in families that, whose families are without the means, that we would see an increase in a need for dental attention. And I don't think we've ever had that proven out yet. It's been a number of years that we've been doing this, but I would like to make a motion that we pass this presentation in its entirety to our medical officer of health to come back um, and advise us on the legitimacy, not to say that I don't think there's any legitimacy, I don't want to be on record that way, but to verify um, if there are any discrepancies in here, because I did hear one thing today that I followed up on um, fluorosis as a question with um, uh, our dentist, and there are more than one reason for, for children to have markings on their teeth. So there's one thing alone out of this meeting that I would like to have some of these questions answered by our medical officer of health. Do we need to do that through the county though or do, can we do it here? We can make a request as a city council to the medical officer of health. Then I'll make that motion I'd if it's in order. I'd be, happy, I'd be happy to second that. Uh, can I ask a question here? On the motion? Yeah. Okay. Well, I've seen different medicals, medical officer of health commenting uh, on some issues of toxicology, pharmacology, and to be frank with you, I'm not sure that they have proper training to do that. I remember a few years ago, there was a gentleman who went to his medical officer of health, asking him about Vioxx and whether he was taking any risk and whatever. He was prescribed it. He didn't want to take it. The medical officer of health told him it was all fine. Just to see it, a week later, it was removed from the market. So, you know, I... Uh, and I'm not sure whether, you know, like, why don't we go to somebody who really understands this issue, somebody like, like uh, certified toxicologist, pharmacologist, and so on. Because, you know, the, the medical officer of health, well, okay, maybe, maybe that's a good point. Maybe they can get uh, some advice. Yeah, okay. There is a motion that's been moved and seconded. Councillor White. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bradley. Uh, just curious as to uh, whether we can um, also ask in this uh, report back uh, that we have, if the medical officer of health, health believes that there is um, a benefit to uh, fluoridation in some form, that uh, we could have some kind of alternative measures uh, recommended as well, whether that's providing topical uh, products to the low-income families that uh, Councillor McDougall referenced as being of concern. Uh, certainly we know that uh, a lot of uh, residents in this city may not have regular access to uh, dental care um, and uh, it is often uh, cited as a, a rationale for continuing to have this in the water uh, to offset some of that reality and wondering if the county or through the city uh, we could offer some kind of alternative program or op options for that. Thank you. Well, I, I see a big benefit of having the medical officer of health give us opinion. If he's in favor, for example, taking the fluoride out, that will swing all the county people to be in favor of that because he's paid by, by all of us, by the Sarnia and London County, and they will respect his decision for sure. So there's a big benefit of having the medical officer of health give his opinion. Thank you, Councillor Gillis, and I'll call the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I believe the Medical Officer of Health has given his opinion in the past, but nevertheless, it's always good to go, go again to that well. Uh, with regard to children, I believe that we do have at the county a program that's called Healthy Smiles, mm -hmm. and it does um, speak to this, the issue that you were talking about, that you were referring to. I don't know how broad it is. I'd have to go back and read it again, 
but um, it's there. That program is there. So I'm in favor of going back to the medical officer of health. I, I know what his answer was the last time. I'm assuming it will probably be the same this time, given the fact that the minister of health has sent out letters to every municipality encouraging them to put fluoride into their water for all of Ontario. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm not optimistic that that's going to give you the answer you want, but nevertheless, um, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Councillor McDougall, then on the question. Yeah, I, I guess in terms of the, the presentation, most specifically to the points that you're making, which are quite correct, Councillor Gillis, but there is a, a significant amount of time and research that this individual has put into this. And if we simply, if we pass this over to our medical officer of health, then, um, then this information can be looked at by someone who is working in this county for the public interest. Because we broadcast our meetings here, this information goes into the living rooms of our community. And if in fact there are things in here that we could look at alternatively through laws or otherwise, then we may be able to draw it out through an analysis of information presented, which is why I made the motion. I think it's probably fair and, and um, we should support it. Speakers, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? And I'll, I'll take this moment to say I'm serving notice of motion to, for a future meeting that uh, this issue be put on the ballot in 2018. There is a prescribed question. It was put in by, uh, by the public. And um, the question is very, very clear. And I think it should be on the ballot. So the next council and the next council will know the public will. So I'll serve that as a notice of motion for a future meeting. And that's under the Fluoridation Act. There's a uh, there's a specific question. Uh, just, a que just a question to that, though. Um, I don't want people to think that if they vote for it in a plebiscite, we are still governed by law so that even if our municipality overwhelmingly supports it, unless we do something with laws, we're stuck with what we have right now. And so. many, a number of years ago, Councillor Gillis, I brought forward a plan to have all the laws groups do the same thing at election time, and it mm -hmm. fell apart. So. Um, Maybe you could broaden that out then and go bring it I, to the county. And I do believe the public who put it in should have the right to decide whether it stays. And times have changed and attitudes have changed. Mm -hmm. But I will bring that forward to you in the next uh, next while. Okay. 